Good evening and welcome to the Aspen PSPS webinar series on cancer pain management in the era of COVID-19. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. The webinar will begin promptly in one minute to give some additional attendees time to log on. Again, thank you for joining us tonight. We will begin in one minute. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Aspen PSPS webinar, Cancer Pain Management in the Era of COVID-19. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. The webinar is now beginning. I would like to introduce our moderators this evening, Drs. Timothy Deer and Dr. Krishnan Chakravarti. Gentlemen, take it away. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. Cancer pain is certainly a very unique area of medicine. And at this time of COVID, it's been very unique as well. So tonight, in the next hour, and we'll be right on time for you, we have a great panel for you to discuss several aspects of cancer pain, for both today's times and for the future. And joining with me tonight is my dear friend, Krishnan Chakravarti. Krishnan, you want to introduce our panel? Krishnan, you're on mute, my friend. There we go. Um, there you, go. you know, I Thanks. Um, so we've been kind of uh, moderating the last uh, six of the different sessions around COVID. And uh, this one's actually a really uh, a special one because I think it's understated how important and um, uh, in terms of just patients that are uh, given in that arena of cancer pain and the importance of trying to get good care to them. I think, you know, one of our uh, chants that I had with spending some time with Lisa Stearns, you really get to see the empathy and the emotion that goes into taking care of these really sick patients. So uh, one of the pleasures I have is to introduce this group of folks that have been really thought leaders that have really set the standard and benchmark for how to treat these patients and have come around to creating a lot of the algorithms that we think about all across the country. Uh, Dr. Gulati, um, who had needs no introduction, is uh, out of... Um, New York has really been heavily spending a lot of his career developing a lot of the treatments, um, a lot of the thought process around how to triage these patients, how to take care of them in an effective way. And Don, of course, is another person who needs no introduction out in Hawaii, who runs a really successful private practice. And so they're going to really start with uh, really talking about opiate management and also what to do in this new current climate of COVID-19. So I'm in, and Don, take it away. Uh, thank you, Dr. Deer and Dr. Chakravarti. Uh, I guess uh, I just wanted to spend a couple minutes of what's been happening at Sloan Kettering. Then I'll give it over to uh, Dr. Sparks here, and she can uh, continue from there. Uh, you know, obviously for our cancer pain patients, uh, we we can't not deliver care. Um, it's very tricky. Um, just in cancer in general, if we delay treatments from 30 to say 60 days, we can change the staging of cancer. So it's a it's a tricky environment where we know that if a patient gets the virus, they um, may be putting themselves lives in risk. At the same time, if you prevent getting treatment, the same situation happens. So we know that we have to treat these patients. So you know, we didn't necessarily shut down our pain clinics. We just triaged our patients um, accordingly. Um, you know, obviously telemedicine really took hold in the last two months, and we were already beginning the transition to telemedicine because of some regional re uh, reasons in our in, in our practice, and managing opioids became a challenge. And part of the management is that we know that oncology patients have the same rates of abuse, um, same rates of tolerance as some of the other populations in chronic pain, um, but you can't manage them accordingly. You, know, you, know, you can't do your urine toxic screens like you would in a random fashion. Um, so some of these things are still being worked out in our, in our hospital system, um, trying to figure out how can we still manage opioid management safely? And then how can we implement some of the things that we implemented before, which was to mitigate or to reduce 
um, op reliance on opioids in general. So some of our interventional strategies, some of our intrathecal drug delivery systems um, were being delayed because we couldn't have surgery. So that therefore patients are on opioids a lot longer. Um, they're exposed to some of these opioids that can be immunosuppressive uh, in nature. And so a lot of decisions had to go through and how what things can we provide in a short term um, to get these patients through their pain crisis and at the same time, um, what interventional strategies we can still provide our patients so we can mitigate opioids. Yeah, before Don, before you go, uh, Dr. Sparks, uh, I'd like to ask Ahmed a question. So you, you mentioned immunosuppressant, and you said certain doses of opioids that would cause immunosuppression. Uh, what are those doses? I can't seem to figure that out. You know, I've asked that from some other folks recently. What dose do you worry about, and when would you take someone off an opioid? Uh, when it comes to immunosuppression and metastatic disease, uh, I think you look at the animal models that are suggesting morphine and fentanyl may have those kind of um, effects where natural killer cell cytotoxicity and lymphoproliferative um, and cell cells will be well, those cells will be decreased as a result of morphine and fentanyl. I'm not sure it's dose related in the human model, and a lot of these things are controversial when it comes to human models. There's some data for morphine maybe increasing the risk of community acquired pneumonias in the elderly population. Um, so what I tell people when it comes to opioid management is, an oncology is a very structured. Um, discipline. So their research uh, is very well thought out and these kind of cofactors for influencing um, disease survival and remission rates are very stringent. And morphine is the pain medication that's commonly used. It's hard to see morphine having a real effect on survival curves in oncologic disease. However, um, from animal models, we know that oxycodone and hydromorphone tend not to have these effects. Uh, buprenorphine and tramadol tend not to have these effects. So instead of thinking about dosing, which is very difficult to find in a human model, what I suggest usually to our patients is consider hoxycodone and hydromorphone as your first line strong opioid. Uh, consider tramadol and buprenorphine as some of the medications you can do first uh, line for post-operative pain and some other strategies, and then use morphine and fentanyl as your last line opioid, even perhaps behind methadone, which tends to have less effect in the animal model. Wow, that's extremely, extremely helpful. Uh, Dr. Sparks, your thoughts on these issues? Yeah, no, I I agree with uh, Dr. Galati, and thanks for all of that information. That was great. Um, basically, when patients have a uh, cancer and then we're in a crisis like we are now in this world pandemic and maybe they're having an intrathecal pump they're also um going through a lot of psychosocial uh issues as well too so if i did a pump fill during this whole thing which i had to uh the patient was living alone she was elderly she was having cancer you know and all of these things and i gave her those options as well too to say you know we're going to do this pump fill but these are the medications that if, if we were going to think about like adding any additional medications for um, pain relief in addition to the pump, if the pump isn't being efficient, that we would not want to use morphine, we would not want to use fentanyl. And also the idea of patients, I'm a very huggy person and most of you probably know that. And, um, and patients like that. And especially when we're going through something like this where there's like no socialization, I, I feel like the patients really strive for that. And, and I'm just curious about how everyone else too is going to kind of introduce that socialization back to um, their practice. Yeah, so um, Dr. Trigovarthy, what do you think of the hugging? Yeah. Uh, missing no, the social and look, I, no, I, I and I think that's there's so much to say for how important that is in terms of building mm -hmm. rapport with patients. And I, I think one part of that is the assumptions are that if this hopefully within the next three to four months that we see a reduction, we're gonna get back to some semblance of what we had before. But you know, one thing I, I've heard uh, through a lot of webinars now is that telemedicine is here to stay. And I think what's unique to a lot of cancer pain management is a lot of the multidisciplinary aspects of different services. So this is actually a, a question of Dr. Gulati. Do you see there a benefit to some extent of transitioning to this virtual forum as being able to deliver better care across multiple kind of uh, departments with oncology and pain management working together, maybe triaging and actually providing better care because of it? Excellent point. Uh, so one of the one of the uh, when people ask us how we manage our cancer patients and our in our hospital, 
um, one of the questions I always get is, how can you get your oncologist to send you referrals? And, and my, my take home message has always been, you have to go to the oncologist and be a part of their team. And so we've had the opportunity at our hospital to be part of different tumor boards for years. Uh, spine tumor board, bone tumor board, uh, you know, various oncologic tumor boards that have had their surgical disciplines, their radi radiation oncology disciplines, and then now have a pain service associated with that. With telemedicine, what we've seen dramatically quickly is that they have transitioned their tumor boards to an online format, uh, Zoom or, or a webinar or some form. And so now it's actually much easier for us to join these webinars, introduce ourselves and be available for uh, consultations. And if you're in a place where maybe an oncologist may be far away, you can provide that pain care through telemedicine that day now, which is what really cancer patients need. When oncologists think that a patient needs pain care, they don't want their patient to wait four weeks or six weeks or eight weeks for a new visit. They would like that patient to be seen that day. So now the point of care has changed. The ability of a, a pain physician, and that's a group of us, to be able to offer oncologists immediate access to a pain physician, and then we can triage to interventions uh, will dramatically improve if we take advantage of this moment. And that's what we've already done at Sloan Kettering, where we've seen two tumor boards transition to uh, a webinar format, and now I'm a part of those webinars. Uh, it's easier to get those consultations that perhaps may have taken weeks. You can provide that care the same day, which is what a patient truly wants and what an oncologist truly wants to have for their patient. No, I mean, I think that's, that's so uh, amazing. It improves the care. Uh, Dr. Sparks, let me ask you another question about the about the social part you brought up. I think it's so important. You're so good at it. Uh, I had a patient last week, and he actually uh, was sent to me by his primary care specialist, but he was in the waiting room of his oncologist doing telemedicine with me on his phone, and he was going to get a CT scan of his liver, and he started getting teary-eyed, and, and I could tell he was very anxious. What are your tips to, to those attending this webinar? What are your tips, since you can't hug them and you can't touch them, what can you do on the phone to give them the same sense of, of caring? What's your, what's your advice? Well, I think that um, in general, it's, it's kind of just the more thoughtful listening and just asking a lot of open-ended questions. And um, there's been a Quite a few patients who said that they they wish that they could hug and you know just allowing them to have that moment um i've done air hugs you know like they're and and just let them know that we're going to get back to this we're all going to get through this you know this this era of covid 19 will probably be forever you know written about in textbooks when we're all gone and 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 this i hope i mean i really do hope that this will bring like the humanism back to medicine because uh, Dr. Gladys, right? Like you can actually just go onto some of these platforms and add a patient and see him right away, and it gives you like this uh, greater flexibility that I don't think that we ever had before because our lives were uh, pretty rushed and stressed, and and we had full schedules and we just had to go from one room to the next. And this might give us the availability that we didn't once have before. So yeah, that I, I long thought... bring that along with bringing the humanism back to it and just letting them know that, you know, this too shall pass. You know, I, I have to say that's an amazing point because you hear so often patients are just scared to even come in to get a procedure or to come to right. clinic. And you right. think about how these things can make sense in all different settings, not just in cancer pain. So I, I think that I really appreciate that part of it. I mean, I think that's something we can all take home and say, okay, that's something we can implement. So, yeah. Let me ask you one more question, both of you, before we, I don't want to leave your panel without this question. I think it's very important and, and I'm going to start with you. And, and the question is this, we have a lot of fellows attending this webinar and we have a lot of young people who just really have started treating cancer patients. In fact, I, I, I left my probable field of, of, of cardiac anesthesia to go into pain because of a cancer patient I was able to treat with an epidural at end of life. So it changed me and made me become a pain physician. What would be the one word of advice, both of you? would give to the younger doctors on this webinar about this issue we're talking about communication and opioids and telemedicine with cancer patients. What have you learned in this pandemic uh, for both of you that you'd like to pass along as a word of wisdom to these younger folks? Now, what, I, what I've realized is really uh, emphasizing that even with a situation such as a pandemic, you really can't lessen your compassion for the situation that your patients are in. They're in a worse situation now. Uh, 
uh, now they can't get their treatment they want, um, and now they get scared of getting treatment because of the virus. And we're in a we're in an area where people don't want to come into a hospital and get treatment. And so you really have to put yourself in their shoes and be much more lenient with some of these things of opioids and decision making on whether uh, we should be using. Uh, a non-opioid when an opioid may be the best course of action. For oncology patients, the data has always been opioids have been very, very helpful for our pain patients and treating a patient's pain. And we don't want to lose that um, because we have so many other options. In this situation, uh, keep in mind that the opioid still is beneficial. And some of these things that have come out in our, in our, in our field, which have really is, pendulum has swung the other way, uh, doesn't really apply to some of our cancer patients. Keep that in mind. So if I have to come up with one word, I guess my one word is going to be tenacity. And I think that we all have that and we've all proven that. And if you're a fellow, you know, you're still using it and trying to find a job in this time and everything else. But um, as, re as related to, to cancer patients, you do, um, as Dr. Galati said, want to have compassion, but also passionate perseverance just to help them to get to that next level. Because uh, even though we don't know if our lives will ever go back to normal, if there'll be a new normal, they don't know how much longer their lives are going to last. And you really want to be there mm -hmm. for them when they need them. Inspirational. Yeah. Very inspirational so, words. Great, great, great discussion for both of you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, there might be some, there might, there might be some questions at the end if we have time. So hang around if you can. Thank you so much. Great, great words of wisdom yeah. from both of you. Yeah. Good to see uh, everybody. Bye-bye. Krishnan, you want to discuss our next panel and introduce our Yeah, so um, kind of our next panel, we wanted to give uh, the folks today a perspective, not just from a individual practice, but kind of a larger health system. Um, Dr. Greider uh, also needs no introduction. He's been really instrumental in working on the physician administrative part of it, and he's really carved out the latter part of his career, really looking at adoption of big policies, et cetera, across health systems. And Dr. Kali also around working in Rochester and upstate New York has done a lot of stuff. So we want to really give them, a, give our fo folks a perspective on, you know, the challenges that uh, health systems are facing, especially specific to cancer pain patients and what you guys would give advice for folks that are uh, listening today. So Dr. Greider. Thank you, Kristen. So in the Midwest, a lot of the issues that we're seeing are we haven't actually had a surge of COVID patients. Yet we have this shutdown that has paralyzed our healthcare systems. And the most vulnerable of those patients are the cancer patients. It's an interesting phenomenon across the country that people are seeing that people getting access for stroke and, car and cardiac events are down 60, 70%. But yet we've been able to maintain cancer pain and cancer management. And so that's the one area of our health system that hasn't slowed down at all because the urgency around those treatments are, are, are pretty, uh, pretty, pretty significant, obviously. So the real issue is how do you safely care for those folks with immunosuppression and how do you care for those folks that are, that are oftentimes their immune systems are at, are at their lowest during that time? And so that's been a real challenge to set up testing to make sure that, that that the healthcare workers are safe and that the other patients that are surrounding them are safe as well. The third piece of it is in the midst of, of trying to manage chemotherapy and infusion and all of those things, it's the, the human piece of it is actually returning in some really interesting ways. So the telemedicine piece, you guys touched on it, but this pause in the urgency and the intensity of volume has really, I've heard patient after patient after patient say, you know what, this is the first time I felt like people have actually sat and listened to me. And so it's that ability to step back from the pace of practice that is, that is really interesting. And, and I know that we're going to go back to high volume practices, but I, I just hope that in some way we can figure out how to balance out that truly interactive piece that also allows us to see large volumes of people and, and take care of large numbers of people. So that's some of the things that we're seeing in our health system. Specific to the pain management piece is really continuing to try to get patients that are recovering, but who have those neuropathic and mechanical pain issues in for our neuromodulation therapies. And that's starting to open up. And now at, that we're beyond 
the, the restrictions and the surge issues. Jay, let me ask you one quick follow up before we get to Hemont about what you just said. For those who don't know, uh, Dr. Grider runs a large portion of the Kentucky system and he knows it better than anyone. We've had two small hospitals in West Virginia close in the last month because uh, they could they didn't have any any COVID patients, but yet they couldn't do any care. And they they actually went they went bankrupt and closed down Fairmont, West Virginia, Williamson, West Virginia. What about those doctors on this webinar in small hospitals? Is there going to be federal funding to keep those facilities open? I mean, what's your what's your what's your I know you have a lot of contacts in the area of funding for hospitals. So you know it's really unclear. It, it has to do some with the political environment um, a, as well. And so whenever we get into a situation where the entire health system is on is on life support that's actually doing an interview just this past week it said it's ironic that in the middle of a, of a health crisis and a pandemic we also have a financial crisis in our in our health system because those small hospitals tim that you referenced those are low margin hospitals they're working on two and three percent margins sometimes two or three million is all they have as, as a margin at all and that's really no margin whenever you stop and think about it so is the federal government's solution going to be forced mergers with larger institutions that are stable, like we saw with the banking system in 2008? Or are they going to try to preserve the autonomy of those smaller systems? Well, I think maybe they wanted the autonomy of those smaller systems that were struggling to begin with to, 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 to be assessed and evaluated, just like they did stress tests on the bank. I'm not hearing that yet but i wouldn't be surprised if there's not some sort of uh, similar concepting that that's done uh, nationally we're already starting to hear rumblings of, of hospital mergers uh here in in, in kentucky uh and in, and in tennessee and so those larger systems are, are are maybe asked to absorb some of those smaller systems we saw medical practices that that went uh into a real situation and pain practices we started managing quite a few pumps that were just almost abandoned because literally within a week, the finances were so upside down, those practitioners couldn't care for their for their patients. Yeah, thank you, Jay. That's uh, that, that well frames, uh, you know, the situation with practices in hospitals and centers. So that sets a tone for our next uh, colleague. Uh, Hemant, what's your, what's your thoughts on uh, these issues uh, with the pandemic and cancer pain treatment? Yeah. Um, Thank you, uh, Dr. Deer and Dr. Chakravarti, for, for having me on this panel. Um, so uh, here in upstate New York, you know, when, when the COVID-19 uh, pandemic started, um, we were grappling with some uh, tough decisions. It was uncharted waters. And we really had to make some tough decisions, especially in the cancer pain uh, patients, you know, most of the societies um, did come up with almost like a prescriptive, um, uh, you know, instructions on how to tier the procedures for general pain uh, patients. But as far as cancer patients were concerned, we didn't have any specific guidance from anywhere. So we actually had to come up with our own um, kind of a, a system how to address the issues of cancer patients, whether they have active cancer, whether they are at the end of life, um, whether they are cancer survivors. So that allowed us to stratify the risk of cancer patients based on their uh, disease process and where they are exactly, and which allowed us to offer uh, treatments to them uh, almost in a, in a stratified manner. Um, you know, we sometimes had to think, rethink our strategies. Uh, we know that the usage of corticosteroids in uh, in this pandemic kind of you know exposes these patients to unnecessary risk and and you know decrease their immune system even further so we really had to rethink our strategies how to help these patients um, i did more neurolytic chemical neurolytic procedures in the last five weeks uh, um, uh, as compared to I, I did in the entire year uh, yesterday. Similarly, I also saw an opportunity to kind of introduce some of the advanced treatment options um, like neurostimulation or neuromodulation early on, especially targeting the peripheral nerves, which are very low risk procedures, which can be done at bedside in the hospital or as an outpatient, depending upon which health system you're practicing in. And we were able to um, offer some of the evidence-based treatments and some of the uh, treatments which are almost uh, uh, becoming um, uh, you know extinct 
and uh, we were able to improve our patients, uh, not only pain, but also their, their function and quality of life. So this pandemic actually taught us a lot on how to take care of our cancer patients. Very good. Interesting. Um, I have an interesting question for both of you, actually. Um, and going along the lines of, um, we're at an interesting time, let's say, for example, telemedicine. You've talked on multiple panels now of the benefits. And a lot of uh, folks across the country are saying, if we're implementing this, how do we get the message across to CMS of its value to appropriately reimburse physicians to incorporate this, their, this kind of modality in their treatment platform? And the kind of the follow on to that is, you know, um, Aspen has taken a huge leadership in that part of it. And I, I see this kind of being truly a cross society effort. Um, and is it something that you think, uh, Dr. Greider, specifically when you're looking at the entire Kentucky health system, is that where it needs to be advocated for? Or do you really see this coming at a grassroots level? Well, absolutely. I, I think the biggest thing is, is if you wanted to prevent the adoption of telehealth, CMS couldn't have done a much better job with the regulations that they had previously. They, they were so restricted that, I mean, who could have done it? it? It was a person who was not in a metropolitan area within a certain, you know, who could follow all the guidelines? So what the heck would I ever do that for? So making sure that we keep the restrictions relaxed. And the other thing that we find is that whatever the financial incentive is, people tend to follow that. And so you're absolutely right, Christian. They, they, they need to make sure that the funding is there to, to allow people to, to continue to embrace the, that, that technology. Um, otherwise, it will have been a big experiment in teasing our patients with real convenience and access and then pulling the rug back from, from, from them, uh, creating hardship on practices because patients will be demanding the, the ease of that but it will be financially difficult to actually provide it. And you don't want to say, I can't provide this because it's, 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 it puts me at odds with my ability to stay in business. So, so the lobbying is going to be key on this. But I think CMS is listening, and they also see this as a low-cost alternative um, to, to, uh, to drive things in the way that they want to go, actually. Uh, let me ask you. Let me before you come up before you answer this. I, I want to ask Dr. Clay. A, 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 I want to ask you a more specific question based on what Jada said. How do we examine? So let's say they do keep the guidelines relaxed, because I think if reimbursement drops, people will quit using it like that. It'll be gone. But let's say they do relax the guidelines and we can continue to use it. In this cancer population, how do you do a good examination by telehealth? You know, you got you got the you got the video up there and you get the daughter trying to point the video at the back or wherever. How do you examine these people? Is that going to be optimal or adequate going forward for us to do a good job in the cancer population? So I think that's a, that's a great point, Tim. I think that's what I would like to go back to Dr. Bilotti's point. I think telemedicine is, is here to stay. We'll have to exploit telemedicine and incorporate it in our paradigms where we can introduce this to improve not only our efficiency but also patient outcomes effectively so as far as the uh, a perfect example of incorporating a telemedicine visit is concerned you know collaborating with our oncologist colleagues offering a uh, initial evaluation early on and then maybe offering treatment specific uh, almost on a, a spoken hub model uh, a platform where a plan is made um, in the virtual world, but the plan is followed in the physical world um, in, in individual practices as far as the injection therapies are concerned. So some of the uh, uh, evaluations, no doubt, will require physical examination, but you can definitely, as a team, evaluate a patient, get input from your oncologist, maybe have a physical therapist on, on board, may, maybe have an occupational therapist, your palliative care team first, a psychologist, and a social worker all together and patients are booked for maybe a two hour appointment and a common plan is made in with, with all the specialists and then patients can go physically to these nodal points to get these treatments on. I think that's that's where uh, a, a, good, uh, a th uh, good thought out uh, uh, you know, plan is, is gonna be really helpful. Uh, I love that, that's a, that's a great solution. Uh, last question for you guys, I think it's an important one. And then Christian, Chris, I may have a follow-up question. 
Um, yep. If you're writing a textbook uh, going back uh, 10 years from now, and you say, what did we learn uh, in this topic of, you know, uh, rethinking therapies right now during this pandemic with end of life cancer patients and survivors of cancer, what would you say we learned? Uh, we have, we're not through this yet, Jay, so we, we, may, we may still have more to learn, but what are we gonna learn from this that's gonna change the way things are done 10 years from now if another pandemic occurs? Well, you know, and it actually goes back to what Dr. Kalia was, was saying a bit. For us, we, we've seen that, you know, you the old paradigm of, of you get in the car and you go and you drive two hours or an hour and a half to see the pain provider, and you're already in pain, you get there, you wait in the waiting room. You know, a lot of the visits can be contentious just because it's difficult for our patients to get there. And then you talk to them about a theoretical thing like a spinal cord stimulator or a pump that's going to require a trial on a different day and, and all these many things. And, and, you know, people sometimes feel like, what can you do for me today? And I think that's the value of what we've learned here is I can zoom into your living room where you are in the comfort of your home, you've wasted no time, and talk to you about neuromodulation therapies that then allow you to consider it so that whenever you come up here, you're having a learned discussion rather than hearing it for the first time and then going back and rethinking it. It, it, it really has, it, we've actually gotten into a, a, almost a neuromodulation second opinion uh, kind of clinic uh, where people are calling and going, here's what my doctor was thinking about you know, what do you suggest? And, uh, you know, and some of it is around branding of different therapies. You know, the, this brand is what they use. What do you think about that? And, you know, you could give a balanced view of, of, of that. But I, I think that's going to be the thing that that that, that maybe is, is written about is that, um, you know, it's the taking of, uh, of therapies in the patient's home. The other thing that's really fascinating is to see how they live. It's really interesting to be talking to your patient that you've been counseling about smoking and they, they smoke three while you're in your 15 minute visit. You're like, at the end, by the way, you aren't, you aren't really sticking with that non-smoking plan that we had. So uh, if we could just smoke two in 10 minutes, that would be great. So, anyway. Right. So, um, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Emma. Oh, no, uh, I, I completely agree with, with Dr. Brewer, yeah. So I, 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 one one final question before we move on. Um, we hear a lot about the challenges of conservation of uh, hospital resources, specifically to PPEs. Do you think your strategy on uh, appropriate PPE changes between cancer patients versus regular patients that are being triaged, given that they may or may not be higher risk for immunosuppression, and does that have any impact in the larger kind of health system? How do you justify, not justify it? Any comments on that? So one of the things which we did in our center, we actually started testing all patients for COVID-19 before doing any procedure, uh, specifically cancer patients fell into that at category. Um, it did um, impact our usage of PPE uh, as well, because if we have ruled them out for active COVID infection, then we don't have to necessarily comply with all the uh, mitigation strategies, social distancing strategies, yes, but some of the mitigation strategies um, uh, were kind of uh, lenient. So I think those uh, specific decisions helped us to take care of our cancer patients uh, much more effectively and in a timely manner. Um, and uh, uh, address our uh, PPE, uh, you know, uh, issues at the system level in, in our um, hospital. Great idea, I love that. Yeah. I think I think where practices have gotten in trouble, or hospitals have gotten in trouble, is where they're restricting PPE and staff don't feel safe. And um, you know, I think we need to keep the the frontline healthcare workers as front of mind. That are that are out there and and really at risk and and so those strategies that that seem like they're they're risking exposure, um, you know, that those that's where hospital systems have gotten sort of sideways with their frontline workers is is that lack of concern that 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 comes across and it's just in conservation of 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 of, of equipment but it also is you know I, I think. The liberalization of that is important as much as possible. Important, yeah. Yep. 
No, I think that was a great, great panel, guys. We appreciate you and uh, thank you so much. I think your insights are very, very yeah. valuable. And I, I learned a lot from both of you. So thank you again. And uh, we look forward to uh, hearing more from you as we go forward the next few months here. Our last panel, um, and we're, again, we're going to stay right on time for you guys at home. Uh, we're going to look at the management of current cancer patients with pumps because it's been a real issue, you know, and, you know, how do you get them in? How do you film? Do you film at home? What's the risk of putting a pump in? Do you do a trial? There's so many questions. So we'll start with uh, our, our colleagues here. Dalwood, your, your thoughts on this issue to start off with you. Yeah, I mean, I think I echo. First of all, thank thank you for everyone tuning in. It's just amazing, you know, that we have uh, this many people continuing to tune into our webinars with all the other webinars going out there. But I think this is a topic that is, you know, to the people that really are interested in this field, they're very passionate about it. Um, our kind of strategy with these patients with pumps and cancer pain in general is like we never stop seeing them. You know, we really kind of never close the doors on them. I, I'm pretty passionate about um, you know, interrupting care for these people, you know, even interrupting care uh, in for one month with someone with stage four cancer is a huge deal, you know, when, when people have life expectancy of weeks to months. So we never really stop taking care of those patients. But again, we are still grappled with their maybe our most vulnerable patients as well. So we had to kind of take the appropriate precautions to not put them at undue risk. So it really it was, you know, every patient was kind of taken care of or it continues to be taken care of on a case by case basis. We've never really created any type of algorithm or spreadsheet on how to deal with our cancer patients. We really just deal with them on a case-by-case -case basis. You know, this patient has this type of pain. He's got a compression fracture. He needs to be treated. This patient has, you know, end-stage cancer and the pain's not controlled. We really need to move forward with intrathecal pump and take the appropriate uh, steps and reactions. Um, but, you know, uh, I'm going to kind of give it up to Anjum. Anjum is someone I respect um, who does, you know, more pumps than anyone I know on the planet. Um, so I'd be interested to hear how what his strategy has been uh, as far as how to manage these patients. He's doing a lot of unique things, I think, with, you know, home infusion systems and telemedicine as well. Thank you, Dawood. And uh, thank you, Dr. Deer and Dr. Chakravarthy for, for having me on as a panelist. Um, you know, a lot of our cancer patients during this time, uh, you know, they're, they need to stay at home. They are one of the most at-risk populations yeah. uh, for getting sick if they're exposed. And this is during this time and after everything opens up, again, a lot of them are immunosuppressed, a lot of them are elderly. Uh, they, they, they're the one population that doesn't need to be out and about. Um, what we've done is, you know, there are many home infusion companies out there, uh, AIS, Basic Home Infusion, Pentech. Um, we've been using AIS um, as kind of a, a way to continue to manage these patients. And uh, we have a nurse that goes out to the patient's home to refill them, to reprogram them. Um, there's also have a call center, which they check on these patients. So we're able to check, check on these patients probably two or three times a week. Uh, make changes to their uh, pump if needed, uh, get them refilled. So there's really no interruption of care and these patients really feel like they're taken care of. Let me, Andrew, let me ask you a follow-up question on that. So I, I saw a patient on telehealth last week that had metastatic lung cancer mm -hmm. and uh, he was pretty miserable and he was being sent to me because he was on fentanyl and he was on a, a morphine. He was his morphine equivalent was like 400. He was on gabapentin. Uh, and I got a call from his primary care specialist. He said, we just can't control it with the oncologist. And um, you know, he said, can you put, talk to him about a pump? Uh, I see no reason to do a trial on that gentleman. I think we should probably just go to a pump. Do you, you see a reason to do a trial? Am I wrong in that situation? Or what do you think in the current setting? I hate to bring him in twice and put him through that system twice. Right, and I completely agree with that. For for all of our cancer patients, what we've done is we've skipped a trial. These are the only patients which I don't require a psychological evaluation. These are the only patients with which they can continue their oral opioids. Um, we basically go straight to implant. You know, uh, I think Dr. Galati said these are the patients you want to get in immediately. Uh, you not only want to get them in immediately to evaluate them or do a telemedicine visit immediately, but you want to get them a pump immediately to to get their pain under control. So, so we kind of fast track these patients straight to an implant. Um, you know, we appeal to the insurance companies, and, and you know, we've really had no denials because you really don't want to be the person on the other line that says no to a cancer patient. So. Uh, 
we fast track these patients, get a pump, and as we're titrating up their pump, I voluntarily ask them to to wean off their oral opioids. And as you said, you know, if their their morphine equivalents are high, um, I institute a, a PTC or a PTM and tell them to use that rather than taking their breakthrough pill. So um, we try to in, to get them to just use their pump and minimize orals uh, if needed. Comments. So this is actually for both Dr. Syed and Dr. Fox. Um, both of you guys have been very fortunate to able to deliver care in this new COVID-19 climate. And there's portions of this country where entire private practices are going under because they're not able to sustain uh, their practices. Are you going to see a real uh, uptick in the number of management of pumps that are other clinicians, patients that are coming to you? And has that changed your thought process or strategy around that? Or any suggestions for folks in terms of partnering with uh, clinicians like yourself on the early onset if they're having that kind of difficulty that they are foreseeing with their practice and reopening? I think what we've seen is we've seen a lot of uh, practices around the state. I know I've talked to Dr. Grider. There have been some practices that have shut down uh, during this period and they're not able to manage pumps. Um, they've kind of left their pumps to one of these home infusion companies to manage or they've referred them out to either Dr. Grider at the University of Kentucky or, or us. Um, so, so we certainly have seen this. Um, you know, the problem is that you're managing somebody else's pump. And, uh, and that's always an issue when you kind of inherit a pump from somebody else. Uh, you kind of have to tweak it a little bit to, to make it what's appropriate for your own practice. But uh, we certainly have seen this. I, I think that it's, uh, you know, what we're probably going to see in the future are kind of centers of excellence for pump therapy, where you have a lot of these centers that manage a lot of pumps. They have the infrastructure to manage pumps and they have the staff to manage pumps. And uh, we'll probably see a lot of these pump places uh, pop up where if you have, you know, a few number of pumps, it's probably easier to give it to somebody else that manages more. So let me let me follow up on that to Dalwood because uh, Dr. Bucks, you give a you give a great answer, and I think your I think a center of excellence wouldn't be a bad model. Actually, it might be a great model for us all. But Dalwood, what about you know right now? There's two manufacturers in the United States, and let's say you're in a center, and the one company doesn't have a, a, a representative right now who can cover pumps, and the other company doesn't have enough pumps at the moment. There's a shortage of, of pumps, as you you may know. So what other so what can you do for that lung cancer patient I talked about who had multiple multiple metastatic disease? What about tunneled catheters? You know, what's other things you could do if you can't go to a permanent pump? Yeah, I mean, I think yeah, you 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 bring up a great point. We're kind of faced with a little bit of a dilemma here uh, with our vendors for these products. Uh, there could be an access issue kind of moving forward in the short term. Hopefully, it's not a long term issue. But I think you know we still are as interventionalists have multiple tools at our at our at our disposal. I think that's when you have to kind of put your thinking cap on and think about you know the Hemnet. Um, uh, mentioned neurolytic blockade. I've done quite a few of those. I've done actually probably more spinal tumor ablations in the last four to five weeks than I typically do. Uh, and that's because um, <clears throat> trying to avoid general anesthetic and pump placement uh, in the initial phase was one of our biggest concerns. That's actually worked out very well. Um, tunneled catheters, I think, are another really good option and idea. The issue we're kind of limited with here is that we don't really have the nursing, outpatient nursing services that can really manage those patients effectively. So that's been kind of a rate limiting step for us over the last few years. Um, but I think that's those are definitely all really good ideas. But, um, you know, short term medication management in these patients is also always an option. You know, we try to avoid those in our patients and try to decrease their reliance on systemic opioids because we feel that, you know, they tend to do worse and the data kind of shows that their survival rates go down. So. Krishna, you have another question for him before I go to the last question for them? Um, well, I, one, one more actually. Um, so, you know, I, we at UCSD have five fellows and it's interesting. We've seen a uh, almost a significant downtrend in the amount of training around uh, managing as well as putting in new pumps because you've seen an uptick of a lot of these other interventional therapies like PNS, 
SES to manage cancer pain. Dawood mentioned a few that he's been leading. Um, I'm really captivated by the comment on developing centers of excellence for this. Is this something do you think, um, I can tell you most likely best case scenario, everything goes back to normal in the next couple of months, but let's assume this extends out over 18 to 24 months. Should there be another reinvigoration at the fellow level to start focusing on understanding these management and trying to develop a core curriculum around what is it a center of excellence would really require? Um, and especially kind of Dawood coming from the aspect of leading a society, I think this plays into some emphasis on the educational for the latter half of fellows. Do you think this is an important part to really consider for training programs? Yeah, and I can start out this. I know Anjum has some really strong thought, opinions about this as well. But you know, we've been teaching fellows, and um, you know, some of us in fellowships, but all of us kind of teaching them in you know courses and, and in society meetings. And pretty much every every fellow, when you do, when you query them, they all say they want to do stimulators. But when you ask, show of hands, how many of you guys plan to do pumps? A lot of hands drop off. You know, every time. Right. And, you know, I try to, you know, teach the fellows that we have that, you know, you really want to not just be a one trick pony, you know, there's going to be patients that really do require intrathecal therapy. And I think probably, you know, there is some baseline infrastructure that, you know, practices need, but I think a lot of it is, it's just a lack of good training during the fellowship uh, era when they, when they come through and they're, they're not exposed to them and it comes, becomes kind of an intimidating thing to manage a pump. Um, Anjum, you know, if any, he, he's an uh, example I use for a lot of people. You know, they say, well, I'm a solo practitioner. How can I manage pumps? Well, there's a guy down in Kentucky that manages thousands of pumps and he's been by himself for several years. So if he can do it, pretty much anyone can do it. And I'll let Andrew kind of chime in. Well, um, and, and Dawood's right. I mean, you know, if you do pump therapy correctly, they don't hassle you. Your patients don't call you. They come in for their refills and they're, they're doing well. Um, I get more calls from the uh, patients on prescriptions than I do from my pump patients. But, you know, going back to your question, I, I think it's very important to to have education around pump therapy. Um, I think patients do very well with it um, as far as longevity of therapy. Uh, if I asked any of my pump patients that uh, they come in, they say, I'm not doing well. You know, it's a reversible therapy. I can I, I, I always offer. I can turn it off. and and None of them want them to want me to turn it off. They all say, "Oh no, no, no! Don't take my pump away." But uh, patients do very well with it, um, and I think it's important to have uh, education around the, uh, the uh, during fellowship on pump therapy. I have two questions for you guys. Uh, both are one. The first one's very quick. The second one's very cerebral. So, uh, first one is uh, you know, in my practice, I've almost shifted. When Jason Pope and I were working together, Jason and I did quite a bit of research on ziconotide. And I've almost shifted 95% of my pumps now, new pumps, over to ziconotide. And learning how to dose ziconotide, I've been very successful. Very few of those people ever come off it. Um, so my question for you is, what's the role of ziconotide in cancer pain? Uh, since there's no opioid immunosuppression, if you will, if you believe that occurs with what you said earlier about Amit. So what's that role? So that's question number one. And uh, to whoever wants to take that from Anjum and Dawood. You know, we've, we've used a lot of ziconotide in, in our cancer patients. Um, you know, as a calcium channel blocker, it's another mechanism of action. And, you know, these patients usually have been on opioids long term and they've been on, you know, fentanyl patches and oxycodone on top of that. So, so their opioid receptors are overloaded. Uh, so you're introducing something that, uh, you know, through another mechanism of action through the calcium channel that, that actually helps with their pain and, and not adding something that, that attacks the mu receptor. So, so these patients have done very well. I think that, you know, there's a huge role in it. Um, we've certainly seen benefit, uh, and I'd, I'd like to see what Dawood has to say. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, a, it's an excellent drug when it works well in the right patient. Um, I think, you know, for me, it works the best when there's you know, a higher component of neuropathic pain. Uh, typically, our cancer patients have mixed pain. So most of our patients that, you know, we do put pumps in for cancer do require some sort of dose of opioid. 
Um, if you can get a patient with, on a stable pain trajectory, I think it's a really good option for those patients. You know, it is opioid sparing. The one issue that you will probably struggle with with ziconotide is those of us that use it. It really takes a patient that you can be very pa patient with. You know, slow titration is really the only way to do it. Um, sometimes we will find with our cancer patients when they have these pain spikes or uh, their disease becomes more aggressive, they need more aggressive titration. Um, and I think with a narrow therapeutic window of ziconotide, that could cause some issues uh, for a lot of our patients. But I still think it's a good drug when patients with stable disease and largely neuropathic pain. So we have 10 minutes left to be on time. And what I'd like to do is have Krishnan ask a question. We're going to start with you two, and then we're going to go to the other four panelists one at a time. We're going to ask you an important question that everyone on this webinar will take home with them tonight. So, Christian, you can start with these two, and I'll do the next two. So, as far away from an important question. All right. Um, so, on that note of uh, being cerebral, uh, one of our panelists actually asked this question. Um, is there differences in the terms of delivery, PO versus intrathecal, in terms of immunosuppression? And does that change your um, algorithm in terms of considering pump earlier than later in, in pre- and post-COVID? Andrew, you want to take that one? Um, so in terms of immunosuppression, I think that, you know, PO versus intrathecal, you know, certainly I believe with PO, you're going to get more immunosuppression than you would with intrathecal. With our, with our intrathecal doses, we're, you know, relatively low dose uh, and, and getting adequate pain relief with, uh, with low doses of intrathecal therapy. So I think that leads to less immunosuppression. Um, you know, these uh, patients have certainly done very well with that. Um, what was the second half, that second part of that question? That's a perfect answer, Anjum. <laughs> That's that was it. Um, but you're right. I mean, I think you look at some of uh, Tony Yaksh's literature. There's some suggestions that um, obviously in intrathecal versus epidural, there is less immunosuppression, arguably, because you're putting it into a more closed system than something systemic through first pass effect or PO. So yeah. I, I think it's reasonable to consider that. I guess it's just a question of, from your both of your experts in terms of pump therapy, does that change your algorithm? And it sounds that may be of consideration depending on how long this goes. So. That part, you know, I, I think you're thinking about, you know, immunosuppression in that patient population is is such a small portion. The bigger thing that we see is that the toxicity and the side effects. You know, that's immunosuppression might be this much, but if a patient can't, you know, have a bowel movement or go to their chemotherapy because their pain's uncontrolled, that's really a day-to-day -day thing. So we really we that plays a bigger role of me going for the intrathecal therapy versus oral versus intrathecal. Great great answer. Great Can I just answer one oh, quick yeah. Yeah. one point real quick? Yeah. Uh, just don't forget that don't, pain also is immunosuppressive. Um, so not treating pain is important. Yeah. And we do have data that, you know, we did a few studies, early pilot studies, uh, Dr. Baig and I at Memorial talking about converting patients to intrathecal drug delivery, uh, converting to hydromorphone and testing their natural killer cell cyto cytotoxicity and then for proliferative uh, cells. And we found data that was very um, nebulous. So we don't know if the opioid is causing the immunosuppression or it's the pain or there's other cancer related issues because cancers have their abilities up also diminishing the immune, immune response as well. And that's a natural history of cancer. So it's a very complicated question um, beyond just the opioid. Uh, we tried to answer those things early on, um, but keep those things in mind when we're treating pain. Uh, that's also immunosuppressive and we can use opioids to do that uh, to treat their pain. But most importantly, we have animal studies that really show that long-term use of fentanyl and morphine, that immunosuppressive effect reduces considerably. So it's a very acute effect from the opioid and the chronic effect doesn't seem to exist. You know, so I, just wanna, wanna, I just wanna add to what you just said. I, I agree with that, everything you said. In 2002, uh, Peter Stats, myself and Tom Smith and others published a study uh, cancer pain that led to his first level one cancer pain study with pumps and it led to more widespread use. And what we found was people that were had their pain well controlled, had better nutritional status, had better weight balance, had less fatigue, and they tended to live longer. And in fact, one patient would have lived one more day. It would have been uh, statistically significant, the survival, by having their pain reduced and using oral 
Interthecal, Interthecal was much better than oral. So great, great point. Can we get our other three panelists on for a final question? I think you guys make great points. And if we could get uh, uh, Jay and um, uh, Himat and Don on, that'd be great. So, so let me ask you this question, Jay. You've been teaching fellows for many years. Um, I have a great young physician joining me in July. I hope she might be on here tonight, Dr. Engel. And I interviewed three young fellows in the last few days. So I'm going to hire a second person. And I, I don't think any of those folks have done a lot of pumps in their training. Should they learn to do pumps, or is there any need for everyone to to be a pump specialist in this cancer pain world we live in? Well, I think obviously, absolutely, in, in, in my mind, and, and the beauty of it is that the management piece can be learned pretty easily. It's not something you have to pick up in a fellowship. And actually, from a technical standpoint, pumps are not all that difficult to implant either. So if you haven't had great exposure to it, you, you, you were used to doing spinals, you were used to doing epidurals, many of us that were anesthesiology-based. Um, if, if you weren't, it, you probably did a couple of spinals early on in your fellowship, maybe, so uh, you just didn't intend to do it. But <laughs> it, it's something that you can certainly pick up pretty easily. And, and I would encourage people to, to, to really not fear it. As Anjum said, it's really about managing the patient and it's about setting up infrastructure. And once you do that, they are the easiest group of patients to manage in your whole practice. Very good. I, I second that. I 100% I second that. I think, um, it, it pump management is is a dying art and i think cancer pain management by itself is is a very humbling experience and if you have this in your armamentarium to offer cancer patients you can improve their quality of life significantly i still remember my my own experience in my fellowship um, i actually did one pump in my entire fellowship we were not heavy pump uh, fellowship program and uh, over the years, uh, we have reached a stage where, um, you know, we do we do the maximum number of pumps in our in our region. So um, I, I think it's it's really important to have that passion and then groom that passion um, and offer the treatment options and these these uh, therapies to uh, to our fellows so that they can start incorporating these therapies without any fear of them into their practice. You bring up a great point about the fellows, and, and, and Don, we're going to give you the last question of the night. So right. if I came to you and I gave you a shock, and I said to you, Dr. Sparks, I have a shocking piece of information. Let's, let's assume that Dr. Grider and I are doing a survey, which we may or may not be doing a survey, but let's say we're doing a survey. And in that survey, we might be doing a survey right now. We haven't published it yet, so we can't tell you. But let's say we're doing a survey, and we find that the number of doctors who've been out of practice 10 years or more do 95% of the pumps and that people less than five years do almost no pumps. That would tell me that we have a real crisis of teaching young people how to do intrathecal therapies and how to manage them. What would you recommend to the field, the people on this call tonight, what should we do to inspire young people that pumps are important and what does that look like after fellowship to train people? Well, I think that, um... It's a great question, Dr. Deere. Thank you. But I think that in this whole crisis that we're in, the world crisis we're dealing with now with COVID-19, right? Like everybody's living in a state of fear. And if we look at pump therapy and just the uh, information you gave about greater than 10 years, which was not greater than 10 years, um, I think it has to do with a lot of fear-based information. Um, pumps can you know, cause problems, pumps can overdose, you can have pocket fills, like people are living in a fear-based system as physicians, and maybe it's because they didn't do enough in fellowship, maybe it's because they're not comfortable, maybe it's because they think it's too much hassle, um, but overall, when pumps are used and when they're used correctly, uh, they can provide so much good and so much help to not only cancer patients, but, you know, the, the chronic pain patient that, um, you don't want to keep giving pills, uh, you know, the patients that need um, the zaconitide or whatever medications for CRPS that help them to have a better quality of life. And that's like our whole purpose as pain physicians. So I think oh, it's to help them eliminate fear. Oh, great. Yeah. I love that. I never, I never thought of it that way. Dr. Chakravarti, you get the final point that I'm going to talk about. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think to Dr. Bucks's idea of center of excellence, I think 
there's so much emphasis. I think Tim puts it beautifully. It's training is in what you see and experience, the mentor component. So, you know, I, I think uh, you guys all been tasked with probably me or Tim asking you at some point to do more uh, potential society training for new fellows. I mean, this is a great opportunity to reach out and train those folks. And I think uh, mentoring that is a critical linchpin to that. So I think it's very inspirational. I think you guys have all, I'm sure for a lot of the fellows today, it's uh, really rethinking about how important pump therapy is in cancer care. So, so yeah, it's a great, great point. I love that. So a couple of last points. Uh, we, we do have a we're going to have something called Poster uh, to Podium, which is a mentoring program that Erica Peterson is leading along with uh, Himant and, and others. And I think it's going to be an amazing program to help young people get to be impactful. Secondly, you see on the screen a webinar that we'll be having on May 21st. It's CME accredited on interdiscal therapies. And I, I think interdiscal biologics may or may not be the next thing. And we have a great faculty, uh, Michael De Palma, who's a world-renowned uh, expert in discogenic pain, Cass Amardelfon, Doug Beal, um, and uh, Tim Davis, um, and Jackie Weisman, all, all going to talk about interdiscal uh, therapies. And then we have the Aspen meeting in September. And right now, I do believe we're going to be there. And I believe they're going to be there. Many of us will be so happy to see each other. And we'll be doing all the precautions, but I think we'll see each other. And, and there will be a, a course that's a hands-on course. And this, many of the faculty on this call will be teaching that course. And it's going to really teach uh, those fellows who didn't get the full fellowship training. You may not have gotten all the exposure you wanted in your training because of the COVID situation. It'll give you a chance to work with some of these fine people uh, on this call tonight and in our society to help you learn more about those therapies and not just pumps, but also stimulation, DRG, uh, spinal spacers, SI fusion, all those things that we see are the newest innovations. So I wanna invite you to that. With that, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Uh, wishing everyone safety, uh, the blessings of God and uh, good health. So thank you all for coming. As the faculty tonight, you were awesome. And thank you all so yeah, much. Fantastic. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, Krishna.